Yes, the sound of a jubilant rookery end chanting Tom Cleverley's Yellow Army. Welcome to From the Rookery End. Outside Rookery Road after Watford 3, Stoke nil. The queue to get inside the Hornet shop was massive. Still is? Just, I, still I, is. I've just noticed there is someone having to walk around with a sign above their head saying, end of queue here. <laughs> that's, that's a sign of a big club, isn't it? That's yeah. a sign of success. It's like trying to get Wimbledon tickets, this. <laughs> uh, for the tennis, not yeah. the AFC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it is a, a, a bouncing place today. Well, 3-0, we'll, we'll do that for you. Um, my name is John, with me is Mike. Hi, John. Uh, and Jason. Hi, John and Mike. <laughs> Sorry, um, Jason. It's been a week. It's 11 goals in, in well, let's say, eight days. Uh, a win away, a win at home, and a win in the cup. And you can't, at this point in the season, ask for more than that. In fact, I feel like I'm getting far, far more than I expected this year, Mike. What was Donald Trump's day? Stop the count. Stop the count. <laughs> I've been to four games this season because I did an under-21 game on Friday night. Four games, I've seen... 19 goals <laughs> it's absolutely it's absolutely ridiculous look yeah you get, we're getting more than uh, more than we expected a- absolutely I remember John me you and Dave sat what the week before the season yeah. sort of getting a load off our chest and we were sort of preparing ourselves for the worst and I think that was that was important because that's about that's about a wider wider issue but amongst all that we did say you've got to find a way of enjoying it you've got to you've got to enjoy the football well, you haven't had to look far, really, <laughs> no, have no, you? No, in no. the in this seven days, the first week of the season, we've seen a gutsy win away against Millwall, where they had to really, really dig in. Obviously, they went down to two all and, and nicked the winner. Brilliant. Midweek, they did exactly what we've we've prayed for a Watford side to do for what felt like 50 years. Dispatch someone they should do in in real impressive fashion in the in the early stages of the League Cup. And then I felt today was going to be a good test. I thought that Stoke, they are missing a few, I think, much like Millwall on the opening day. They, they, won, they won their first game, and they, I think they finished last season quite strong yeah. as well. They won a few games towards the end. So, yeah, I, I was the same. I felt it was going to be a big test today. And before the game, I was almost like, well, if we can get through this with a draw, I'd take, I'd take a draw. It felt like I still haven't sort of calibrated to us looking all right and mm. was just working on the basis that, OK, I'll, I'll take a point, and that'll be a, a, a decent first week. But... Second half, in particular, I thought that we'll, we'll talk about the game. But I thought, I mean, what's not to love? I think it's just brilliant. Yeah, 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 brilliant. And I think there's plenty of people to love, and I'm sure we'll get to those in the chat. Jason, let's let's focus on today a little bit. We had a podcast last week, and we had one in the, in the middle of the week. The first half today, uh, Mike. I think it was less than two minutes into the game. We sent a message to the group saying, "Oh, too many mistakes. Too many mistakes." Hang on, hang on. I am, I am here, so I can defend myself. <laughs> what I was saying was. That it's a very similar to start to Millwall, yeah. in as much as that the opposition had a lot of the ball, and when we did get the ball back, we gave the ball away quickly. And I, that, and the reason I made it is because it was almost a carbon copy of. You're right; it was very early on, but that's how it was panning out at, at that stage. So let's say we were growing yeah. into the first. Um, yes, yeah. It, 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 I think Stoke started brightly. They had that good chance, didn't they? After a couple of minutes, Backman had to make a good save. Yeah, Mike's right. We 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 did struggle to get out. I think. We can see, I think, how cleverly wants us to play. We've got runners in midfield, and we we get the yeah, those sort of wing backs pushed up early and high. They're finding space, and then we're trying to sort of switch from one side with the, the sort of those central midfielders pick it up in those. I don't know what they call them these in the thirds. Is yeah, it, is yeah, it yeah. The thirds. I don't know. Um, they pick it up on one side, driving across and trying to get the ball across to the to the wing back in space on the other side. We were doing that down the right side quite well in the first half I thought Ryan Andrews perhaps didn't do as well with the ball as perhaps we, we expect him to his sort of passing and crossing wasn't great and perhaps we weren't getting plays into the box when he was in good positions on the left hand side it was a bit more difficult because Ngaki started there he's not comfortable on his left I thought defensively he did, did okay and in fact at half time if you'd have asked me to write LaRussi's coming on I might be more inclined to take Andrews off because of what he was doing with the ball, not doing with the ball, and switching Ngaki across, but I thought he was having an OK game, and try that rather than just taking Ngaki straight off. But, but it, it, it was, yeah, it, we, we were lacking down that left-hand side, and it was all a bit squeezed, and that's why we didn't see probably Georgie get into the game as much yeah. as we expected. I think the thing that Andrews has got going for him is, is that pace, and it just is electric, and I think what that can do is it means he can... 
he can get back and defend as well. In fact, when if he he has bombed on and then needs to get back, it, we saw it on Saturday. We saw it on, and we've seen it again here. You just you, he surprises the opposition because oh Christ, you got back quick. He's rapid. Um, he did hit the post, I think, in the in the mm, first half. Yeah. It was a, it was a sharp sharp effort, but he got in, got his shot off. Keeper was beaten, hit the base of the base of the post, and, and span out for a um, span out for a goal kick. But really, we didn't create too much and. Yeah, I think I think Vacuum Bio had a really troubling first half. Really, I think. Did, did you look over your shoulder just in case he was walking past? <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I feel I feel I feel guilty giving him pelters because I said on on, on whenever it was I don't I don't think he ever goes missing. He does he does try, but he's everyone else is. Um, Everyone else is stepping up a little mm. bit. Everyone seems to know what they're... Well, they don't seem to know. They obviously know what they're working on in training uh, and the pattern of play, the, the, the formation, the style of play. Everyone's doing their bit and really sort of progressing and, and vacuum bio, I think. It's, it's not through lack of trying. I, yeah, I wonder if part of it is the way we play, because particularly if you look at the first half, when we're trying to get it, when trying, trying to get the midfielders on the ball... So then stretch the play and get it out to those wing backs to try and find space. That all looks good and we're moving up the pitch. When we're struggling to find the space and we're having to turn around and slow it down, it then almost felt like we were limited to Pollock playing long balls up to, yeah. to, to the lone striker. Yeah. And, and and that's quite hard for he he's in on his own and he's got if he's got a couple of centre backs on him, it is quite difficult. But yeah, in, in balance, quite difficult. But you, you you're right in terms of you expect or you want to see a bit more from him and then I guess from Ryovic as well when he came on for me I was sort of asking the question has he touched the ball yet mm, yeah. <laughs> in in the late 80 getting close to the 90th minute I can't remember him, couldn't remember him touching yeah. the ball and then he got his head on one so yeah I think it, it's it's a combination of both I think it's we know we're struggling for quality in the strikers that we've got but then also the way we're playing they're probably asked to do a bit more when it's not going well for us yeah and and he was getting by was getting pulled around a bit I think the ref mm. missed, a, missed a couple and he, he got frustrated he can't do that he can't allow himself when his quality isn't up there he can't he's got to be firing on all cylinders to, to be able to, to deliver but I think really first half much of a muchness Stoke certainly the, 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 be, the better side to start with I think round about 25 28 minutes Watford sort of built up a bit of a head of steam and it felt like right okay this is we're going up through the gears a little bit didn't really come to anything I don't think the keeper had had too many saves to get to, to make so all in all nil nil at half time not dissatisfied with that the, no. the shape was there again I think what, what's evident again this afternoon is that that back three and we'll go on and talk about Larusi in a moment. But that back three with the wing backs, for me, it works. It works really well. I think they've, in all the games we've seen so far, they've defended pretty well. They have given up, the, uh, given up chances. This is what for football club we're always going to give up chances. The great entertainers, of course, of 2024, 25. Um, but that the way that back three um, works and is quite nimble. They can move across to to, to cover when when the wing backs are, are going forward. And I think. Before we talk about the substitution, I think James Morris came in so, yeah. for Porto today, yeah. and he played, and played on, in the week, yeah, yeah, and yeah. played on the left side of that of that three. And James Morris gets some criticism, and I think what you want for your centre for your centre backs really in the Championship is for them to be bloody centre backs, tackle, head it away, get it clear. And I think as a as a trio, he he, he never tries anything that he's not capable of, yeah. and that and that's fine with me for centre back. I've got I've got a question about. Maurice, actually, I was going to ask you guys, and uh, or, or, and the way we play. So I, I thought he looked good. I thought he looked comfortable. There was one moment where he got beat. I think he tried to be a bit too cute down the left hand side in the first half and got beat. But other than that, I thought he was he was solid. He's obviously playing there on that left hand side because he is left footed, and that gives a sort of balance across the back three. Do you, you think we can afford not sort of, not a luxury, but can you afford to have a strong full back playing? almost out of position there as a third centre-back when you've got two proper centre-backs big guys in the air Pollock was immense in the air by the way mm. today I thought when you've got those guys playing alongside can you then sort of have 
have that risk, have that experiment of a, a sort of a, more of a fullback there, and that then with us playing with those sort of outside centre backs pushing on a bit more when we're in possession, that helps that side of the game. I think that it's, it comes down to the discipline, let's say, of James Norris mm. to n- be able to play the defensive side of his game, which he always had. You know, he, he, you know, Ngaki and defensively wasn't great, and we know Larusi seemed to not be as defensively great. So I think almost having a left-sided, a proper left-sided, rather than any centre-back on the left-hand side. He'll balance a little bit more and be able to work with Larussi a little bit, a little bit yeah, better. Yeah. And, and I don't think he's a luxury. I think, like you say, I think he's a disciplined footballer because he knows what he's good at and he knows what his role is. And I think, if you call it an experiment, I think it's probably, it was, it was uh, through necessity, I guess, today. We obviously, Tom wants to play that, that formation and quite right too. He's been working on it throughout the throughout the summer and so he want to keep keep that going so I, I, I just think he was admirable in his in it so, today so I guess the next question is if Porto's feeling better next week do you bring him back in or do you keep Morris in as a back three it's a really good question because what this Watford side is still capable of doing and we saw it certainly earlier in the game than we did we did later and we Stoke ran out of steam really didn't we they, they didn't manage to kitchen sink it toward, towards the end and give us a any sort of headaches or, or worries that it was going to be a, a nervy finish. What Watford are capable of doing is being their own, own worst enemies, and sometimes you've got Cisco in back there who can. Thought he was great again. He was he was good today with Porto in there as well. They can sort of there is a there is a tendency for a bullet three balls in a china shop, and yeah. one makes a mistake, then the other one's on red alert, and it and it all gets gets a bit Keystone Cops very very quickly so I think it's a good question Ryan Portis is an international centre back that probably answers that but I, I make you right James I think there is definitely a question that will have to be answered and James Morris has done himself no harm whatsoever which for us as supporters talking about a thin squad we're talking about a thin squad all the time knowing that he can come in and uh, and play that role is, is good again God I sort of I always caveat all this how good a Stoke going forward we're going to play, come up against better I, see, I know you, I was waiting for you to say that Michael <laughs> yeah, I, don't think, I don't think there are going to be we only have to play stand, Burnley twice yeah we don't play <laughs> Burnley twice yeah, yeah they just, this division isn't what it was uh, and the team it's not the same as last year so I think this team is going to in some, some cases get away with a little bit more with a few mistakes I don't think the quality across the whole league is anywhere near as high as it high as it was um, I'll remind you of that Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I'm always happy to be wrong, you know me. Was it great? Was it wise? Substitution at half time. Uh, LaRussi came on uh, in the week uh, and he came on at half time today. Jason, was it just purely about balance? Was it purely about his attacking prowess that, that changed the game? The balance, which made, made the pitch bigger for us, I think. Like I said earlier, I did, he's more confident than Ngaki is going to be going down and hugging that left hand side and sort of attacking around the outside. Um, I, the, the number 22 for Stoke I think he had him on toast for, for the whole of that second half he was beating him even just in, in the foot race every time anything we put over the top or sort of through that channel he was running onto and getting onto he was then taking players on and there was one great little move where he sort of gone through two players it just, just made the pitch bigger and I think that helped Georgie as well on that side of the pitch because it created a lot more space for him one the Stoke players got a bit more to think about because he's more attacking player on that left-hand side coming through. I'd, to be fair to Ngakia, he did get forward in that, in that first yeah. half and he did have a decent chance or two, but it, it just felt a lot more balanced and made the pitch a lot bigger. Gave Georgie the space. He's then attacking the space and it, it just just opened it up for us. Yeah, and I'm, John, old Johnny sits near me. He absolutely loves Georgie Chapatati. He loves a player <laughs> who can get the ball and he runs and he tries to make things happen. He must. He could not... Say anything more positive about Georgie Ch- Ch- right, Chatsy yeah. all afternoon. But I suppose the other thing in the second half, it, it opened up things up for Georgie, but it certainly opened up things for Edo KMB. He <laughs> out of our three second half goals, two, two, and he, well, he could have got a third, came from, from, from Edo. Andrew scored the other one and he, he assisted on the, on the first goal. You say that right hand side came to life, Michael. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and you asked the question about whether that substitution was a, a stroke of genius or a. It, it, it was. Because what he did, he took. We caught them cold. We caught Stoke cold. The Russi got the ball straight away, bombed on. And it was a buccaneering sort of jaunt down the left hand side that led to the 
uh, led to the first goal. That was him taking the ball on. They hadn't been used to that from Ngakia. Uh, we're going to have to compare their defensive duties as uh, uh, or, or abilities as the as the season goes on. But in terms of an attacking threat, it's 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 not. You're not comparing apples and apples if you're comparing Larusi and uh, and Ngakia. He, he it, it was he just caught them cold, and mm. I think you have to give cleverly credit because making the substitution at half time which isn't injury based is quite it's quite bold yeah, I, I wonder if even if it was planned because obviously he's, he's not been in the, yeah. the, the, the squad that long he's only sort of a recent signing isn't he so you wonder if it was okay I'll start with Ngak here on the, on the left and then bring Larusi on at half time and give him another 45 minutes just to, again to sort of slowly build his fitness up I, I, I was also wondering why Ken didn't start would you would you could you have started Ken there? But anyway, I like the way it panned out. I think, yeah. I think, yeah, it's three 0 Love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a hot take there, Mike. I, I think, I think if you, I think, and Gaki is defending. I think that probably makes sense for me. He's mm. going to be more solid than Ken as a as a as a left sided wing back. So I, I get that. Have a look with, have a look at him. Have a look at the opposition, and then think, okay, I'm going to potentially roll the dice with with the Rusi, who is. Not 100 percent fit and, and might might not be as good as as Jeremy at, at, at defending. But you're right, John. I think him him causing havoc down the left, which I don't think it's overtaking to say he did. Every time we went forward, it looked like we we're going to score. Over the first couple of minutes in the second half, every time we did go forward, we did we did score. And it just once you threaten down one side, it, it frees up space, as you rightly as you rightly point out. And um, Kayembe and twice and. Uh, Ryan Andrews with the beneficiaries of, of, of that and yeah it's just threat a th- threats are difficult to deal with and we had them down we had them down both sides we've spoken already about how good Ryan Andrews uh, how important and how his pace is troubling for, for defenders so yeah that uh, the, the Kayembe and, and him absolutely um, got the benefit of, uh, of Larusi and the, the questions he was asking Oh, wait, we are, oh. as, as we stand and record, the uh, Stoke chair lady, I guess, uh, is the highest paid person is, in Britain, is, uh, is heading home. Now we her. She got another. She got another six quid off me today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that'll pay. I don't know if that'll pay for the helicopter fuel, but uh, yeah. It's, been, it's a warm day today. Lots of shorts, lots of uh, Watford shirts. The all three, the new gorgeous uh, shirts. They just in the Sky Sports uh, presenter going past he had a shirt on top but he actually was wearing his shorts and trainers I think you know the standards you've got to keep it all the way Sky Sports uh, but it was a hot day today it turned on that substitution I can't overstate how thrilling it is just to see the patterns they're obviously working on I think something else that I picked up on they didn't necessarily come to anything but there were a couple of free kick uh, moves that were that were straight off the straight off the, the training ground you're talking about John talking about how good Chat for Tadzi is John's absolutely right. He, he he's brilliant. He is a cut above most Championship footballers, and we're gonna we've got to make sure we we keep him. He is the he is the difference. We're watching his two lads play out at the front here. They um, they look like they're pretty handy as as well. But I think his delivery from free kicks was good. There was one where we we fooled everyone and played it down the right hand side. So what we're seeing with this Watford side at the moment is what they're working on in training. Clearly coming to to fruition, and that's as a as a supporter, that's exciting to see. OK, here's my big question for you. If Yasser Espria is not going, maybe going somewhere or another, and we don't know where, we don't know when, would you, if you were Tom Cleverley, at this point be thinking about integrating Yasser into the match day squad? You mean... You for, mean de- for, da- for Derby, maybe even... The, well, the League Cup game, but also the, the last game before the... Well, the, game, the first game after the transfer window, I suppose, which is that Sheffield United game. Are you going to try and add him to this team, or do you think... Do you mean Lassie Rusi? I'm not, I'm not aware of this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, Who's Yasser Spreer? <laughs> don't, don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it depends what, what happens with Spreer. Do you... Obviously, bids have been coming in, and obviously his focus is, is probably going to be elsewhere you'd probably given the way it started you'd probably leave him out yeah. until after the transfer window and if he's still around the transfer window right you then speak to him tell him to get his head down get back in the squad and, and then you start to integrate him but I wouldn't do it until the transfer window shut mm. I, at a push I'd have him in the squad and on the bench 
are you pu- sorry uh, at a push or do you think Tom Clary will be pushed by somebody to no. have him in this world? <laughs> no, I'm not suggesting in that. the window. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not show him off at all. I'm no, no, well, maybe. thirty million, so not twenty five. The, bid, the bids are coming in. You don't need to need show him off what you want if you if, if you are going to sell him. You don't want him to get injured. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I I think Jason kind of alluded to it there. This team, we you know, we've been very effusive about the week, the first week of the season, and the three wins we've seen, the goals, the effort, the shape, everything coming to fruition. Yasser Raspier hasn't been a part of that. He, you know, he wasn't at the training ground until what last week. Um, he's obviously had a bit of extended time off because of the Copper America. He's then been, he's, you know, he's having this issue with both of his agents trying to work out what's going to happen there. He's been flying here. He's been flying there while the rest of them have been knuckling down and that's not necessarily Yasser's fault he obviously he expected to move we expected him to move I, don't, I just feels like things aren't happening in the transfer window that, that quickly it feels like the Premier League cards haven't fallen where they're going to fall yet so there's a lot of a lot of movement about to about to happen in the next couple of weeks I think but this, the, the players who are currently in possession of the, the 1-11 shirt deserve to keep it as do the squad. They're there. They're they're really there on merit. And I think what we're what we're showing is a team that you know they're growing. They believe in each other. And I think Tom has clearly instilled that level of belief in them. To and you can just see it. You can just see it very very early on. It's only a week, but you can see it growing. And I think to to bring someone back in after they've all sort of slugged their guts out over the, over pre season and in these and these three three matches so far I think that would be personally a mistake then of course it's like well we've got one of the most talented footballers certainly in the championship possibly you know in whatever whatever superlatives you want to use are we cutting our nose off to spite our face by not using him so maybe keep him on the bench and throw him on for, for 10 minutes if needs be but for me what we're building and what they're developing and what they, they're, they're working towards, which is going to be a long, hard slog this season. You mentioned the lovely weather, John. We've just stuck three past Stoke, five in midweek. We've won away last week. Everything's sort of chocolates and roses at the moment. It is going to get tough one way or the other, and this team is going to have to pull through. So I'm all for protecting that ethic and that, that team spirit. So... I don't know if I gave you an answer there or not, but <laughs> there you go. You you a no? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think so. He he doesn't want. I don't think he sees his future here. So we should be building for that future without him. From the Rookery End, a podcast about life following Watford FC. Uh, it's summer holidays. The from the Rookery End team have been all over the place. Dave's uh, I don't know if he's going to try and do this for tax reasons, but he's he's not in the country again. Uh, he's in Lisbon this weekend. Jordy's in Spain. He's always spends most of uh, his, with his wife and family uh, in Spain. Me and Jace were walk, talking on the walk up here. We've got to keep them out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> We've done all the permutations. It's yeah. those two. <laughs> and, and, and Kieran as well. Kieran's not around. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, Hollywood. Yeah, you sorry, three, just stay away. Has <laughs> Colin been yet either, Carl? No, no, no. no, 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 no and there's more. another one. Keep them gone. <laughs> keep them gone. Um, but it's all that time of year when you're out and about. Uh, you, you, you see a hornet somewhere uh, on holiday. Um, I was at uh, Camp Bessel with the family, uh, and during the, the big lights and firework display, Rocket Man with Elton John came on, and I heard a voice go, Yellows! <laughs> and out of nowhere, I said, Yellows! Back again, just to make a connection. It was dark, I couldn't see who it was, and who it was. It was you. Just say hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I, I obviously mentioned to you earlier, John, we bumped into someone when we were on holiday in Weymouth uh, wearing a Watford goal. Only day it rained, so it just so happened that it was the day we saw him. By the other half, she sort of stopped to talk to him and I joined in the conversation. I think he was sitting behind me today. I, I was going to have a word with him, but he left before the final whistle. I think he, he disappeared. So I, I was sitting in a different seat. So I was, I was oh, right yeah. behind my normal seat because we had an extra body with us today. But yeah, he's, he, it looks like he's only two rows behind us. So I'll have to try and catch his attention next yeah. week. Well, you have to wait until it rains to see this. <laughs> <laughs> Jordi sent us a message from Spain uh, about the encounter he had with a Watford fan. I'm on holiday in a part of northwest Spain called Galicia. Uh, very nice up here but it's historically been quite uh, underdeveloped. And it's rural nature and a uh, huge amount of coastline means it's experienced a lot of emigration over the centuries to the point where there's a legend that when Neil Armstrong jumped out the lunar module, there was a Galithian up on the moon waiting to uh, welcome him. So in this, in this small village I'm in, um, the other day I was walking through the village square with my son James uh, and we noticed uh, a group of 
of young adults with special needs walking towards us. Uh, and one of them, a young lad with Down syndrome, broke off from the group uh, and headed towards us. And I said to James, look, he's, that man's got a, a shirt that looks like Daddy's one. And as he got closer, I could see that it, that it actually was exactly like my one. It's the, the one made up of Watford badges, kind of not quite as leery as the yellow one from a couple of years ago, but it's like the holiday shirt. Uh, and I realised that I was wearing uh, Watford shorts, so you could see the badge, and he'd seen it and headed over towards us. We made a nice little chat about the 5-0 win against MK Dons and the 3-2 win against Millwall. Talked a little bit about the season as the rest of the group kind of looked and the monitors looked at us wondering what on earth was going on. Uh, and then we had a, he, had a, he went on his way with his, with his group. It was, a, it was a lovely moment. It just goes to show that, just like Galithians, you're never too far away from a hornet. I love that. I mean, it's great. I mean, there's a lot that's not great about football, but that, you know, seeing that flash of your team, you say, is that, is that what's the patch? It is. <laughs> should, I, should I go over? Yeah, yeah I'm going to. <laughs> and then it just, it's just, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you're always going to bump into to someone. And obviously, that's not unique to, to Watford fans, but that sort of sense of belonging and just being able to share... And especially when you're away or something in a sort of different atmosphere like best of all yeah. like when you're not thinking about football at all it's like oh yeah 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 it's, it's great and that yeah that, that sort of wider footballing world it, uh, it often throws up lovely little tales like that doesn't it another Hornet Heaven out this week I'm going to prepare you you might see a tear in your eye uh, Ollie does that with his writing funny ones and then emotional ones but this one particularly here's a clip Mrs. Tulpit, are you there? It's Kieran from number 24. Lizzie looks up. She doesn't remember a Kieran, and she doesn't recognise the eyes that are peering through her letterbox. What is it, love? I brought you the programme from the Watford Liverpool game yesterday, Mrs. Tulpit. I thought you'd want to see it. Thanks, love, but I don't go anymore. You want to see it anyway. There's something in it. Just. That- Push it through the letterbox if you must. No, I think I, I think you'll want someone with you when you see what's in it. This cuts through. Has something awful been printed in the programme? Lizzie stands up and tries to put herself together a little. She gathers her dressing gown to her chest, then she goes to open the door. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. You'll just have to take me as you find me, love. Come in a moment. Thanks, Mrs Tulpit. So what's in this programme? Well, it's... Actually, I I think you'd probably better sit down, Mrs Tulpit. If they've sold Abdullah de Corre, I'm afraid I'm not bothered anymore. No, Ab scored yesterday. Actually, did you see the result? Three all. Great game. We were in the lead twice, went behind and came back to equalise in the last minute. You missed a cracker, Mrs Tulpit. I reckon Marco Silva's going to hear and laugh. Please. I don't want to. I'm not... What did you want to show me in the programme, love? Lizzie sits down on her sofa. Kieran stands. He passes her the programme. That's Andre Gray on the front. We signed him in the week. Club record fees. Is he why I'm sitting down? No, sorry. I'm only telling you about him because I'm excited about the new season. The thing you need to see is... Open it at the first page, Mrs Tulpit. Then it's on the left and, um, well, I don't know how you'll react, but... Lizzie opens the programme and looks at the inside cover. Lizzie feels a tremor take hold of her. Are you okay, Mrs T? We're the Orns, you're the Orns. Come on, you Orns! In the club's fan media event this week, uh, myself, uh, along with Peter from Do Not Scratch Your Eyes, uh, and... Callum from Hornet's House, which you might find on Instagram, uh, got to chat to two of the key members of the Watford's women's team. We spoke to Renee Hector, who is the, the new head coach. Uh, last year, she was in charge of the uh, Watford women's development squad, and she was a former player uh, until she had to retire at age 26 uh, due to injury. We also spoke to, to Megan Chandler, who's been with Watford for many years and last year became the women's captain. And they kick off the season this weekend away at Hashtag United. They'll be playing this year in the Premier League South Division. Now, unfortunately, the women's team were relegated from the Championship last year. And I had to ask Megan how she has uh, recovered to get ready for this new season. Rested. (laughs) 
in the back at the back end of the year we got promoted I didn't really have a rest I had maybe a week where I didn't do anything and then I was like oh we're in the championship we've got to go full out and then in the end that actually hindered me going into the season because obviously we put in a lot of hours we put in a lot of traveling over the year mm. like your body needs to recoup and recover and mentally everyone needs to switch off like not just players but staff too um so this summer, I've definitely done that. I, I had a full month off where I didn't do anything and I've, I've stuck to the plans that the guys sent over and and I feel better for it, honestly. Like when you're coming off the back of a situation like a relegation, you have to have that time to switch and in order to process what's happened and, and then so you can put it behind you. Otherwise, you do tend to come into the season still maybe hanging on to some, some negative energy that you should have just let behind you know it's difficult because it's such a tough situation and scenario to be in but I think obviously having one previous already I knew that going into this year that I had to process it understand how it made me feel move on from it otherwise going into this season you're still thinking about something that's happened and has been done and and you're not then present and ready for what's to come. You said that the team weren't clinical enough last season and it was just the small margins that uh, got you relegated? It became painful towards the end because every game that we played, we had someone of of some sort, whether that was a player, manager, a staff member of the opposition, telling us how good we are and how great we are in possession. And if we just had, you know, clinical areas in our box and then their box, you know, we would have we would have probably been sat mid-table, but obviously football don't work like that. This may come across quite weird, but involved in two relegations now, it becomes almost second nature to have that within the group, how to stay high in such low times. Obviously, last season, we lost quite a few games and, and football is it's, it's a hard game. And we had so like 80% of it right, but those 20% in that league, it, it's, it's the difference. And unfortunately for us, I think that was the difference. We was great in the middle and keeping possession, but when it comes to scoring a goal and keeping a goal out, we, we weren't so good. And ultimately, that's what wins you and loses you a game. So this season, we've obviously recruited well in those areas and strengthened. So we're hoping, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be the same case this season. And and obviously, we're well aware that's an area in which we needed to work on. And, and we've done that over the course of the preseason and and you're seeing that confidence now come out in people and in players that might have, you know, lost that at the back end of last year, which is nice to see. And and it's, it's set up, us up into a nice place, ready to go into it this weekend. But Rene, at 29, you are one of the youngest, if not the youngest manager in the top three tiers of the women's game here in England. How have you prepared yourself for this, this new role, really? What are you, what are you doing differently? I feel like when I was playing, obviously, I, I played at a relatively high level myself, you know, for, for Watford and Spurs. And I think I always knew that one day when I stopped playing football, like management was something that I wanted to go into. I never had the official title, but I was very much had the personality of a player coach when I played. I was lucky enough to work closely with sort of my head coaches and stuff as I was going through the years in my late 20s and my full-time job outside of football was to coach. Felt like I sort of built up that experience from, from quite a young age. And obviously, unfortunately, I was sort of forced into retirement a little bit with a bad injury when I was about 26. Um, and I didn't quite fully recover from that. The dream never changed. It just came earlier than what I thought it would. And and that was to obviously go into coaching, go into management. And obviously Watford supported me massively in you know, allowing me to to help with the development side at that time to go for my UA for B badge and then obviously was made head coach of, of the development side. So that was new to me, but it just felt right because I knew that's where I wanted to be. And then obviously over the past couple of years, I've had more experiences with, with England and working with some of the coaches last year. And I've had great support and mentors around me, but I think to be a head coach at this age, you've got to back yourself a bit. You have to have the confidence to do it because I'm sure a lot of people are looking at it thinking I'm not the most experienced coach in the world. But hopefully what I can make up for is the understanding of how the players feel and exactly what they're going through and sort of that that hunger and that passion and desire. But as well, some good knowledge that I've picked up probably really since I was about 20 years old, I've been 
properly coaching since then whilst I was playing so nine years is quite quite a long time to be in a sort of 11 aside coaching setting so just try to try to learn as much as I can like a sponge and you know just really build on my coaching career especially since my since I got my injury that's when I could fully focus on it and just like yourself of course Tom Cleverley is, is new to head coaching have you given him any advice I wouldn't say I've given him any advice but <laughs> I have I have bumped into him a couple times and and you know we've we've caught up on on things in in terms of where in the women's side and you know we introduced ourselves to each other obviously but I, I knew who he was um but yeah introduced myself obviously it's nice having um Damon over there in the building because he could he's sort of that can be that in between in terms of introducing um us to to staff within the men's side and, and sort of building that relationship and that rapport now so yeah, when we see each other in and around the training ground, we'll always say hello and have a handshake and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's really nice to sort of feel as as one, really. Megan, one of Tom Cleverley's uh, assistant head coaches, Damon Lathrope, was your manager last year. What did you take from him as a, as, as a manager? What do you think he's adding to the men's team? Damo was our head coach last year and then obviously in our promotion league as well. And do you know what? Not only is he a fantastic coach and mentor, but his mentality when times are hard is honestly something that's so admirable and something that I learned a lot of him, especially last season, I had a lot of of, of niggles of injuries and, and didn't get to play as many minutes as I had hoped but he taught me so much about how you dictate you know your interpretation of what life can be and and even when you're injured you don't, it's not you're not down and out and and I think him obviously he had a career ending injury and he couldn't play no more and he obviously same as Ren like went into coaching and his mentality during that time was honestly in, inspirational and I think the way he taught us, not just as as players, but as people, was was something I will take moving forward. Obviously, being being the captain and stuff, it taught me so much, like another dimension to what being a leader is. And I think Ren resembles the ways in which in demo works, like people first and players second. And and that to me was something that I hadn't had in a long time being in football. How he was with me and and the and the group, especially during those hard times, was something that I will definitely take on into this season and the seasons to come. Because you know, like there is so much more to life than just playing football and and a game on a Sunday. You know, you have families, you have work. You, you know, there's so many other things, and sometimes you get so lost within the football hall that you forget how lucky you are. And I think once you appreciate not just football, but everything around you, your game grows and you become so much more of a well-rounded player. And I think for me, like missing so many minutes, I lost sight of that. I always, I just, I remembered me as a footballer, but I'm not just Meg the footballer. Like I'm I'm a mum, I, I work, you know, like I'm a friend. And, and he taught me that, you know, yeah, you do put so much effort into football, but you can bring so much more than just you as the footballer and how he was is just something that's really inspired me and and I'll take that yeah in seasons to come not just in football but but life. So not only do you have your former coach Damon around the building and Rene is your new head coach you also have Helen Ward who's the current Watford women's general manager former Watford captain just before you how does she influence you still? I mean legend let's just say that but how she is as a player was obviously phenomenal the position she got herself in like you wouldn't see her move for half the game but she she did when it mattered and and that's what made her one of the the greatest strikers and she won't mind me saying that she'll be the first to say I barely did anything but I was there when it mattered and I think her her natural instinct at goal and and just how she was as a leader is something that's really inspired me and and made me grow as a person and a leader too we're very lucky to have both Damon still around obviously with Ren and, and and Helen in that position as well so yeah they're definitely two people that have pushed me to be better as players and as people over the last few seasons you've been playing regularly at the Vicarage Road uh, getting some great crowds down there you had a particularly uh, important game uh, where you beat Oxford United 2-1 in your last promotion season what is it like for the players being at Vicarage Road I mean, for me personally, it's my fave. You can't beat that night against Oxford. 
you know, what was it, a Wednesday night against Oxford, a must-win game at the Vic. I mean, I think there was a bit of tactical change of venue there just to, to get... Because when you're at the Vic, you do attract a bigger crowd. I mean, the Vicarage Road is right in the centre of Watford. It's like a lot, it, like you say, easily accessible for people. And I think that playing in a, a stadium like that gives a different buzz to one like Willstone and that's no disrespect to that venue at all but I do think there's there is something special about playing in a stadium and and we never take it for granted like it, it's something that we appreciate so much and and we would love to play there more and hopefully we'll have a few games there this season but I just think it helps it helps grow the game the women's game within Watford as well you know we we're here and we want to play in front of the fans and we want to get more people through the door like we're not just here because we love playing football we want to grow it and we want Watford to grow. We've been lucky over the last few seasons. We have seen a gradual growth in, in people attending. But are we happy with that? No, we, we're we not going to settle for, you know, two or three hundred. We want to we want to keep attracting more and more and, and showing people that, you know, it is a lovely place to come watch. And I think if we played at Vicarage Road a little bit more, I think we would have a bit more of an edge in terms of that. But Hey, look, we work with what we've got and, and we just got to make sure when we are there, we give we put on a show and, and show people that watching What For Women is is the one. So come to Wheelstone as well as Vicarage Road, not just when we're at Vicarage Road. And Rene, if there's one message you could give to all the Watford fans, what would you say that they should be getting excited about with Watford's women this season? From me, one thing for sure is that no matter what the result ends up being, and I know that... 9.9 out of 10 times. I'm hoping it's going to be good. Um, you're going to enjoy watching us. That's for sure. 100%. You're going to enjoy watching us. So calm down. Give the girls a boost. It always helps to have fans behind you, especially in that last 10 minutes when it becomes really, really difficult. Um, no matter what the result ends up being, you're going to enjoy watching it. The last two questions were posed by Callum from uh, the Hornets House. Uh, you can find it on Instagram, give it a search uh, and start following him. Hearing from them was absolutely fantastic. It's a great to know that the relegation, it did hit hard, but they are in a better place. A great network that they have, the Watford women's team, to you know really st- step up again. Uh, now, that even, even though they've been relegated, they're going to be able to hopefully uh, start a season really well. But when it comes to women's football here on from the Ukraine, we always like to hear from Kieran. Uh, Kieran Taven, he is a, a Watford fan. You heard him many, many times on this podcast. Formerly used to work at Watford's uh, women's team, but he is, well, basically, there's no finer way of saying this. He's a women's football expert. Written a book all about it, worked for the FA on it, worked for FIFA on it. He is a man who knows what he's talking about. So, Kieran, how are you feeling in the run-up to this new season for Watford women? Yeah, thanks, John. I thought Megan and Rene actually spoke really well. I was particularly impressed with Megan. I thought spoke like a captain, spoke like a leader. Didn't make any excuses for last season. Very open in her assessment of where their weaknesses were, where their strengths were. She was absolutely spot on. I saw a bit of Watford last season. I know Mike also saw them. And they did dominate some of those games that they lost. They did possess the ball well. They just seem to lack that kind of clinical edge at the in the final third and were probably a little bit naive and vulnerable at the back, but actually played pretty well and weren't necessarily out of their depth. They didn't really take any hammerings. And they got some good wins last year. You know, They won away at Charlton, who finished right up there and were challenging for promotion into the Women's Super League. But they have got to deal with the fact that they're third tier this year. I think they should really be pushing near the top of that division. Obviously, we have to remember this year that, unlike when they got promoted last time, when they had to play a playoff against Nottingham Forest, uh, they had to go and play against the Northern Division champions. This time round, the Northern Division and the Southern Division both get promoted. There are two teams that are relegated from the Barclays Women's Championship. So... They really should be pushing for promotion. They've still got a good core of players that were that have remained from the championship. I hope that they get the support that they need to be able to push for promotion. They've made some good signings. Anna Philby has got women's championship experience, has just joined uh, and will play at the back. Um, obviously, it's a new experience for Rene Hector, you know, really young head coach, as, as you mentioned in in the presser it's going to be interesting to see how she adapts she was a no-nonsense defender I saw her play as a teenager for Watford 
Um, but I thought it was really interesting what she said about the experience she's learned as a coach. She's played under some good coaches. John Sullivan was her coach at Watford, who's now in the England setup. She would have played for Karen Hills at Tottenham Hotspur, who's now at Charlton, very, very experienced head coach. Um, Juan Amaros was the joint manager with um, with Karen Hills. Juan is now uh, a manager out in the United States, actually won the championship with Gotham City FC a couple of years ago. So I think it'll be interesting to see how, how that one works out. Um, I think that uh, Watford, as I say, should really be pressing. They should be pushing. We'll see how it goes. But I, I'm hopeful that it's going to be a good season. From the rookery end. So, what a week. What a great week. Still got a couple of weeks left to go uh, before the transfer window finishes, but all is great. Mike? For sure. <laughs> you. <laughs> Played three, won three. I've been to them all. There's been there's been things that obviously need to, to, to work on. I think they were... If, if I was critical about the Millwall game, as we gave the ball away too, too easily, and Tom himself said we made it too hard. I think the reverse was true today. We started off with a bit of that and then really, really grew into the game, got the three goals um, and, and then really saw it out in, in expert fashion, really. I thought Quadro Bar, who came on and again, looked solid, looked big. He looks, he looks like he's going to be really decent off the bench. I think he's one that, that deserves a nod. I think he should have had a penalty in, yeah. the, in front of the rookery towards the end and then Stoke broke. Great save from Dan Backman. Mm. To keep his uh, keep his clean sheet and to keep that that uh, clean sheet bonus, which I'm sure he'll be he'll be pleased about. But really, I think that was the only sort of I would have been gutted if they'd scored. I wanted oh, yeah, I wanted yeah, it to yeah. be a clean Absolutely. sheet. Absolutely. But really, I thought the way they saw it out because even when you're two 0 up, three 0 up, you're still thinking, oh god, if they get a quick fire, two goals here. It's just hardwired into me. I know it's pathetic, but it's <laughs> the way I, I thought the way they grew into the game took their chances when they when they arose I think at 2-0 up we were absolutely we were battering them um, Stoke were on the ropes and it would have been nice nice to score that third a little bit earlier and really really put it beyond doubt but in terms of like a performance the way it develops just really really good as you said John there's no point worrying about what's how good Stoke are and how good the team we played last week or next week is you play what's in front of you Watford dealt with it incredibly well that is all power to Tom all power to the squad. Let's hope he can we can get a couple of additions in there because I think it is still thin. But in terms as, as, as first weeks of the football season go, you're not having that one back. Brilliant. Yeah. Doing all right for a team that can't score and can't defend. <laughs> <laughs> is there the instructions? I think t- from Tom next Saturday when we turn up here for, for Derby, he just goes same again, lads. <laughs> yeah. That'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to Fun the Rookery End. Uh, thank you to Geordie, uh, thank you to Kieran, and thank you to uh, Rene and uh, to Megan for, uh, for chatting to us on the, on the fan presser. Uh, more of that next week, hopefully. And thank you, as we ever said, to Watford. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. You ons. Come on, you ons. Come on, you ons.